Okay, questions? mechanism like we had on the take-home quiz, sure. Um, <clears throat> so let, how about this one? Blood. Okay, let's say we add HCL to this, to this product, or HCL to this diene. So numbering one, two, three, and four. <coughs> now, bless you again. So the issue is that where am I going to add the H plus? In this molecule. Carbon's one. Well, it's symmetrical, so your choices are either one, or one and four, one or four, or two or three. Hold on, we'll take a poll. So how many people say one or four? How many people say two or three? It's okay, you can be by yourself. So what's my rule? Why did you say one or four? And then we'll come back to two or three. Carolyn? Add the hydrogen to the end of the chain. Okay, that's, that's my rule. And what's the reasoning behind my rule? Form the more stable carbocation. Because I want to form the more stable carbocation. So if I add the H plus then to carbon one, and we will come back to adding bit two or three. If I add the H plus then to carbon one, I'm going to end up with the H here, the plus here, and the double bond there. Okay. Now, why, why would somebody propose that I add the H plus to carbon two or three? You, Katie, you were the only one with your hands up, so that's, and it's fine. So you're, so you're using the strict definition of Markovnikov's rule, which says that you're going to add to the double bond with the most hydrogens. And so if I do that, I end up with this carbocation. So which of those two is more stable? The one on the left or the one on the right? Hold on, take another poll. So which one of those two carbocations is more stable? The one on the left or the one on the right? How many people say the one on the left? How many people say the one on the right? Okay. So the one on the you say the one on the right because what what's the reasoning there? Somebody who said the one on the right. It's tertiary, instead of secondary. tertiary instead of secondary. So that would make the one on the right more stable. How about somebody who said one on the left? What would you think, Melanie? Okay, so the left one is the secondary allylic, so maybe what we should do is write its resonance structure, and then we can do some comparisons. Is there any resonance structure, any additional resonance structure I can draw for the carbocation on the right? No? It's, it's pretty much done. So now let's go ahead and draw the resonance structure for the one on the um, left. So if I do that, I'm going to end up with that resonance structure. Okay. 
So adding the H plus to the end of the system, in this case, the one or the four, I'm gonna get two carbocation resonance structures. And if I add to carbons two or three, which would be the true definition of Markovnikov's rule in terms of adding the H to the carbon with the most H's, I only get one resonance structure. So does two beat one. Does two resonance structures beat just one? <coughs> well, if you're concerned about the tertiary and the secondary part, what's this one? That's a tertiary carbocation, and that's a tertiary carbocation. So if you're concerned about a tertiary versus secondary, I just tied the left and the right, but now it's got an additional resonance structure, and so that's going to make the left that's going to make the left one more stable. So here's the issue. The issue is that we're going to use the broadest definition of Markovnikov's rule. The strict Markovnikov definition of Markovnikov's rule is you add to the carbon with the most hydrogens. But the reason that I have the rule that you add to the end of the 1,4 diene system is because I'm going to form the more stable carbocation, which is now sort of the broadest definition of Markovnikov's rule. You always want to add the electrophile to form the most stable carbocation. And what you're going to find is in this system, which was in the ring, there were the double bonds that were at the one and the four position, or the methyl groups that were at the one and the four position. If you add it inside, you need to add the carbons one and four because it's exactly like this system. So we're always, this is the reason why we always add to the end of the system. That's why I made, that's why I said that's the rule. We never add in the middle. So what I'm doing is I'm forming the most stable carbocation because now I can form two resonance structures. And the worst case scenario is that you've got a secondary versus a tertiary, but when you write the second resonance structure, you now have a tertiary, so you're tied, and then the extra resonance structure wins. Does that make sense? I didn't get a chance to do that at the end of class. Somebody asked me at the end of class, like, why wouldn't you add in the middle? For this one, and the reason I, and the reason I give you these, I gave you, well, in the practice problems, there's this one, and then there's a methyl group off of two and three, and when the methyl groups are off of two and three, it's easy because strict Markovnikov rule also matches up adding at the end. So when I give you these problems, what you have, I'm going to have to make these symmetrical so that one and four, there's no difference. Because otherwise, if it's unsymmetrical, then you're going to have four different products. Because you could add the H plus at this end, and that's going to give you two different products than if you add it at this end. So I always make it symmetrical. Um, and then you always add to carbon one or four. So that's that issue of that problem. Let me, let me do this problem a little bit differently to give you kind of two options in terms of solving it. And you can turn in your, I'm not, there's no homework or quiz problems for Monday. So if you need to go back and take a look at that, you can. So you can just turn those problems in on Monday. Um, but let's just, let's look at this problem from the standpoint of doing it.
which is what your question was, can I do a problem from start to finish? So let's do it from start to finish. Let's say I'm not, I, I'm not real, I'm not real good with the mechanism of forming the resonance structures. Is there a way that I could do this problem without doing the resonance, without drawing out the allylic carbocation, then moving the pair of electrons to form it? Yes, there is a way. And that is that if I'm adding HCl to this, let's just write our 1, 2, 1, 4, sorry, start all over again, our 1, 2, and our 1, 4 product. So if I'm writing the 1, 2 product, what I have to remember is that it's not that one, that I'm just adding the H and the Cl to carbons 1 and 2. Okay. So if I draw the 1, 2, 1, 4 product, I don't even need to know anything about the mechanism. So if I gave you this kind of a problem as a write the products of the reaction, you don't have to go through the mechanism. You just have to go, okay, there's my 1, 2 product. What's my 1, 4 product going to look like? My 1, 4 product is going to one, two, three, four, and you just have to remember the double bond then goes between two and three. So I can write my one, two, and my one, four product without going through the entire mechanism. And then what we could do is then we can work backwards to get the carbocations. So how did we get the carbocations? The chlorine added to what was a C plus. So now I'm just going to say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and put a carbocation where the chlorine was in both of those structures. And then that's where the Cl minus added. And I'm not going to ask you for transition states in these reactions because there's too many. There's there's a potential for too many dotted lines here. You got a resonance hybrid, um, so I'm just going to ask you to do, to write the intermediates. Okay. So if you start with the one two one four product, then erase the chlorine. That's where the plus charge goes, and that's where the chlorine added. Okay. And we know that these two then are resonance structures. Bless you. And then to start then to start with, I basically took my one two or I took my carbon one position, I added my H plus to it, and that gave me the original molecule. So you can work, so what I'm doing is giving you an alternate way to write the mechanism. If you don't want to write it from beginning to end by adding the H+, plus, writing the resonance structures, and you're able to write the 1, 2, 1, 4 product, you can write the 1, 2, 1, 4 product and then work backwards on the mechanism. Because everywhere the halogen went, or the OH went, with the water, then that's <coughs> where carbocations started out to be. Okay. The only other thing I'm going to, Carolyn, that's the only, that's the last thing I need to do is write the resonance hybrid. So, what's the resonance hybrid look like? When I'm writing the resonance hybrid, I'm going to write all the sigma bonds, all the single bonds intact. And the resonance hybrid is going to have whatever was added to carbon one. Right, so now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to average out my bonds and my charges. So in this case, there's a single bond here, a single bond here, a single bond there. 
a single bond here, a double bond here, a partial double bond there. A double bond here, a single bond there, another partial double bond. So writing the resonance hybrid is kind of like writing the transition state. The resonance hybrid is nothing more than the average of the two resonance structures. Now I'm going to average, Katie. Okay. So now I'm going to average charges. So delta plus zero, sorry, plus zero delta plus. Zero, zero, zero. Zero plus delta plus. So what you find what you find with writing the resonance hybrid is everywhere there was a there's a double bond is going to be a partial double bond and everywhere there was a positive charge is going to become a delta positive charge with these systems but if you're in doubt average bonds average charges that gives you this as my resonance hybrid That's the next thing we do. Okay. Everybody with me so far? <coughs> so then the kinetic versus the thermodynamic product. So what's the what is the let's start with thermodynamic product. What's the thermodynamic product? It's the most stable. So what am I going to look at if I want to determine the most stable product? The the double bonds. I want to look at the double bonds. So which one of these two products then, and, and it's the 1, 2 versus the 1, 4, which one of those two products has the most substituted double bond? The 1, 2. The 1, 2 product has a double bond with three groups around it, whereas the 1, 4 product just has two. So this is this then is the thermodynamic product. And remember, what when I'm determining the most stable of anything, I need rules. And so I have rules for double bonds. I have rules for carbocations. I don't have rules for primary, secondary, tertiary halides because there really aren't rules. So the halide doesn't come into play. Only the double bond comes into play. Right. Now, you could say, well, the other one's got to be kinetic. <clears throat> probably, that would probably be the case in 99% of the problems. But then you have to hope I don't find the 1% problem to put on the test. So we're better off just to go back to the basics Okay, thermodynamic product, most substituted alkene. Kinetic product comes from the most stable carbocation intermediate. So looking at that, which one is that? This is a secondary, this is a tertiary. Since this is a tertiary carbocation, then that puts this as the kinetic product. And for these systems, it will always be that way. The most stable carbocation intermediate will always give the thermodynamic or kinetic product. The most stable product will always be the thermodynamic product. So most substitute. Everybody kind of okay with that? So that's just another way to do it. If you want to add the H plus to carbon one or four, then write the res then draw the resin structures. You can do it from beginning to end that way.
Any other questions? So like I said, for these problems, what you can do is if you want to, if you, if you, if you're okay with that, you can turn it in. If not, you can turn it in on Monday. Doesn't matter to me. Then I don't. Have, then I have less grading to do over the weekend. But then I'll have more grading to do next week. But it's either. It doesn't matter. Okay. Now. The way organic is built, at least the way it's been taught, we work from allylic systems into adding a second double bond to form a diene to forming the ultimate conjugated system, which are benzenes. So I'm just going to go through a quick review of benzene. It was in the video from Wednesday in Wednesday's folder but benzene is the ultimate conjugated system when you've got six a six membered ring with three double bonds alternating with three single bonds that is the ultimate conjugated system because there is no beginning and there is no end okay. and what that does is that makes that gives benzene a couple of interesting properties Number one, it's flat. It's a flat ring. Okay. And as a flat ring, that has some, some consequences in terms of how you can, um, how its physical properties are. It also gives you two different resonance structures that you can draw for benzene. And this just kind of shows you the difference between um, starting out with the double bonds in one position and then you can alternate them into the other. And when benzene was first sort of discovered, and I should say benzene, well, okay, so there's two classes of organic compounds. There are your alkanes, alkenes, alkynes. And if you want those, the sort of mother's milk of alkanes, alkenes, al alkynes is crude oil. So that's where we get primarily our alkanes. There's a few alkenes and there's an even fewer amount of alkynes that are in crude oil. If you go and get crude oil from wherever you're going to get crude oil from. Um, Aromatic compounds come primarily from coal. So in terms of the aromatic compounds, if you're in a coal-rich country like Germany, which is where organic chemistry really started to be developed, uh, it was probably developed also in Russia, but we didn't know what was going on in <coughs> Russia at the time, other than killing and everything else. Um, there was... In, in Germany, they had a lot of coal, and so they began the idea of developing chemicals from coal. And what you would do is you take the coal and you would heat it without oxygen. Because if you heat it with oxygen, it's just going to burn. But if you heat a piece of coal um, without oxygen or maybe under a vacuum, you get a distillate that's called coal tar. And it's just that, tar. But in that tar is a whole bunch of different um, organic molecules that then became building blocks for dyes, for medicines. And so it's really the coal tar that gave the German chemists a lot of things to work on. And we'll get to like TNT, you know, the explosive is an aromatic compound that you can make. You shouldn't, but you can make it. But you could make it. Um, so that's kind of where the that's kind of where the aromatic compounds come from. Is come from they come from coal. So once people isolated benzene, then they knew it was C6H6, but they didn't know how it was drawn. They didn't know how to draw the structure. 
And so there was probably a good 20 years where people were debating all the possibilities of benzene. And the person that came up with the structures we now know is Kekulé, and this is the famous story of him um, basically having a little, he had a few too many adult beverages one night, and this problem was on his mind. He fell asleep by the fire, and he had a dream of snakes where he thought benzene was the snake wrapping around and grabbing its tail, which it is, kind of. And so then he proposed that benzene was the six-membered ring. Um, it took a while to say that these two were resonance structures because the rule is, well, the easy way to determine um, whether something is or whether these two are resonance structures or real structures is, let's say I put two methyl groups here, and if I put those two methyl groups there, in terms of the double bond placement between the, um, between the, double, between the methyl groups themselves, we would actually expect that if these two, if the bonds didn't, if there wasn't a resonance structure or resonance hybrid, that those two would be different molecules altogether. Because the double bond between the two methyl groups would be different than having a single bond there. And so it was quickly, in chemistry terms, quickly might mean five to ten years. It was quickly determined that instead these um, rings or these double bonds were more of a resonance structure. They, were, they weren't fixed. Originally, they proposed that the benzene rings were just simply switching back and forth between the resonance structures very rapidly. Now we know that that's not the case. Now we know we have a resonance hybrid, but that was all done with benzene. That's kind of like my example of resonance. The resonance hybrid is the average. It's the hybrid. So my example so my, ex my absurd example of the resonance hybrid is that if you had a pit bull and a chihuahua and they had a baby dog or a baby puppy, I suppose you could call it, that would not constantly be switching between a chihuahua and a pit bull, as cool as that would be, right? This is how the whole genetics thing pretty much works. So. The resonance hybrids don't constantly switch back and forth. But it took people a while to realize that. And they did that with benzene. Once, one Super Bowl years ago, they had the Doberman head on a Chihuahua that was chasing a car. And I almost had to consult my legal team because I think they borrowed my idea about the resonance hybrid. I did ask this, I did show the video and say, what, il what does this illustrate for bonus points? And not very many people got it, so. But we didn't know that. We didn't know that the resonance structures were constantly flipping back and forth. We now do. So I came from benzene. Um, benzene, very stable. So there's two word, there's one word that we use to indicate that the molecule is super stable, and that's aromatic. So when we talk about benzene molecules being aromatic or benzene or aromatic compounds, yes, they are aromatic, right? If you have mothball, if you go to the dollar store and you buy mothballs, that's naphthalene, which I'll show you the structure of in a couple minutes, that's an aromatic compound. So yes, they do have a they do have a fragrance, they do have an odor. But that's not the real definition of aromatic. Aromatic means super stable. So what we've talked about in terms of reactions of double bonds or of conjugated systems, I could add Br2 to a double bond. And I should add the two Br's trans. If I add Br2 to benzene, nothing happens. If I add KMnO4 to benzene, nothing happens. If I add sulfuric acid, which would be H plus H, nothing happens. 
So benzene is very stable. And it will not react under most conditions that other double bonds will react. You can't cleave it. You can't add Br to it from Br2. I will be able to add Br in another mechanism, but it's not just going to be Br2. Okay. So that leads benzene into being aromatic, and what aromatic means is super stability. Okay. So that's where I want to jump to after one thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about, and a lot of this will come after break, but we'll talk about this on today and, and Monday. Um, we're going to talk about, real, about adding things to benzene rings. And we're going to talk about things like ortho, meta, and para directors. So what we need to know is we need to know what is an ortho, what is meta, and what is para. Those terms are used for di-substituted benzene rings. So if something is 1,2 di-substituted, it's called ortho. If it's 1,3, it's meta. And if it's 1,4, it's para. And so we'll work our way to those molecules and say, oh, well, this is ortho dimethylbenzene, or this is para dimethylbenzene. So the 1, 2, 1, 3, and 1, 4 we will use, so I'll introduce them now. If, well, at least in my lab, um, when we were looking at the proton spectrum in the seven parts per million region of the proton NMR, if we saw two doublets, that meant that it was a paradise substituted ring. If it's ortho or meta, it's not two doublets, it's a mess. But when it's two doublets, it's always, it's always a paradise substituted benzene ring. So that's what we want to, that's what I want to work into now. What are the rules for molecules to be aromatic? And when I say aromatic, I mean super stable. So here are some rings that are fused together that are called polycyclic aromatic compounds. They are also abbreviated as PAHs. For the most part, PAHs are bad. They're carcinogenic. Um, they're all flat, which gives them particular properties, particularly with something like DNA, which I'll show you. So naphthalene is the simplest polyaromatic hydrocarbon. Um, naphthalene is mothballs, has a mothball smell. Anthracene, if you think, if you've heard that term in relationship to coal, that's um, found in coal. Then there's benzopyrenes. Um, biphenyl is not a fused system. But on the other hand, if you have a poly chlorinated biphenyl, that's a PCB. And those are exceptionally toxic. All the PCBs, like all environmental problems, go back, you know, this one, the PCBs, they were in transformers that were on the telephone poles. So if you've ever heard of like Love Canal in Buffalo, and you weren't even born, when that was a problem you weren't born yet. I was. So I remember the news reports of them finding all of the PCB laden um, soils in a particular area of Buffalo. And so that was, that's where PCBs made national news. But they were like outside of everybody's house because they were in the transformers. As long as the transformers stayed on the, tr on the pole, they didn't explode or anything like that. We didn't have to worry about PCBs. But that was one of those big, huge environmental issues back in the 70s. I said so that was a long time ago. But that's what a polychlorinated biphenyl looks like. So, again, polychlorinated biphenyl, super stable, hard to react, hard to get rid of. 
persistent in the environment for a long time. So flatness, there's your double strand DNA with your intercalation sites. I've only had one semester of general biology and that was second semester senior year while I was taking biochemistry. Those freshmen were not happy. There was a little bit of a curve that was busted in that class. But I don't get bonus points either. So I know, I usually say I know this much biology and my fingers are really close together. I might know a little bit more, but. So here's your DNA with your intercalation sites, right? Those are the grooves in between. Flat molecules fit in there very nicely. And what are my aromatic compounds? They're flat molecules, so they kind of fit into those sites. Of course, what makes up the DNA so that they can hydrogen bond? Nice flat molecules. So there's aromatic compounds that are helping hold the DNA together when it forms its hydrogen bond. <clears throat> Whoever designed that, or if it was just a random act of nature, that's another class, another place in the, built, in the university. But if I was gonna scaffold something together, I probably want my things holding my DNA to, to be unreactive. So an aromatic compound would be perfect for that. So I could get my hydrogen bonding scheme together to hold it in place, and none of the core reacts. Right. So we don't want it to react, we don't want it to mutate. Mutating DNA is a bad thing, usually. Unless it gives you some superpower, um, I don't think that's actually real. I don't think superpowers are real. So what does it take to be aromatic and unreactive? Or super stable? There's two rules. Rule number one, all the atoms in the ring have to be sp2 hybridized. And if all the atoms in the ring are sp2 hybridized, the ring is flat. So that's interchangeable with my ring's flat. My ring is only flat if all of the atoms are sp2 hybridized. That's rule number one for being aromatic. Then there is a, a total number of pi electrons. And that p number of pi electrons has to fit a certain number, okay? We're not going to talk about the theoretical significance, but there's a rule called Huckel's rule that says the total number of pi electrons has to equal this formula of 4n plus 2, where n equals some integer value. So I think of this as just simply a way to generate the correct number of pi electrons you need to be aromatic. So if n is zero, you got two. If n is one, you've got six. If n is two, you've got 10. So that formula then, if we don't get into the quantum mechanical significance of it, which we're not going to, that formula then says, here's the number of electrons that will make my system aromatic and make it super stable. So that number is 0, 2, 6, 10, 14, 18. After that, you just keep adding 4. So those two rules have to be fulfilled in order for the system to be aromatic, which means it's super stable. So here are some examples. And it turns out that there are three classifications that I can put these molecules in. So when I say aromatic or not, it's actually aromatic, non-aromatic, which means that it just doesn't fit either of those two rules. So one, one rule is um, not followed. 
And then there's anti-aromatic. And the anti-aromatic means that it is super unstable. So an anti-aromatic means that you have a planar, you have a, a flat ring, but you have 4n numbers of pi electrons. And when you have 4n numbers of pi electrons, that makes the system super unstable. So we can kind of take these of these molecules one at a time. So for instance, cyclopropene. What do you think? First of all, are all the ring carbons sp2 hybridized? No? Because there's a CH2 here. So when one of the rules is not followed, this would become non-aromatic. Now, you could argue, but wait, that's planar. And it is, because it takes three points to define a plane. So with a triangular structure like that, it is planar. But that's not what the rule says. The rule says all of the ring atoms have to be sp2. This one is sp2. So that one's non-aromatic. Cyclobutadiene. Are all the ring carbons sp2 hybridized in that molecule? Yes. How many pi electrons does it have? Well, remember, for each pi bond, that's two pi electrons. So this one has what? Two electrons here, two electrons here. It has four electrons. 4 pi electrons. Does that fit the 4n plus 2 rule? But it does fit the 4n rule. So if it fits the 4n rule, then that makes this molecule anti-aromatic. And so what does that mean? That means that you're going to have a really difficult time making cyclobutadiene. And if you do, it's going to be incredibly unstable. Now normally, if normally in science when somebody says you can't do something, people try and do it, right? Because that's just the nature. If I can do something that you that the rules say can't be done, then that's fame and fortune. Probably no fortune involved, but at least you get your name in a book somewhere. So for this one, can it be made? It actually has been made for like a fraction of a second. It's been made, and it's been its structure's been studied, and it's not square. It's kind of a parallelogram, and it's really unstable. So they could study it for less than a for less than a second. So it has been made, but it's just really, really, really unstable. Okay, um, the cyclopentadiene molecule that we talked about with Diels Alders on Wednesday. Is it aromatic? Well, my answer would probably be no, because we did reactions with it on Wednesday, and superstability means you don't react. So it's not, why not? Because what does it have here? It's got a CH2. So with the CH2 there, the rings are not all sp2 hybridized, so this one would be non-aromatic. 
so really in terms of our rules we should look at the ring first and see if there's any non sp2 hybridized carbons there jacob that's okay so yes it does but the 4n the 4n or the 4n plus 2 rule will only be will only come into play if the ring is all sp2 hybridized atoms or if the molecule can choose to do that. So we, we have some technical stuff that we have to deal with probably on Monday. So yes, it does have 4N, but since it's not completely planar, we don't have to worry about it being anti-aromatic. The other thing that, that'll sort of, will come into play here is a molecule will, I'm given the molecule again, human characteristics, the molecule will never choose to become super unstable. The cyclobutadiene here has no choice. So you could say, well, what if this molecule decided to become all planar? If it did in this one, it would be super unstable. It would never choose that. So it would much rather be non-aromatic, which just means it's non-aromatic. It's not as stable as an aromatic system, but it's not as unstable as an anti-aromatic system. So that's why we always look at the ring system first. This one, there's a CH2, so it's non-aromatic. If we look at this one, there's another CH2, it's non-aromatic. This anthracene we saw on a previous page all of its ring carbons are sp2 hybridized how many pi electrons does it have two four six eight wait two four six eight ten twelve fourteen so this has 14 pi electrons does that fit the 4n plus 2 rule yes 14 is a number of electrons to make a system aromatic The stop sign shaped cyclooctatetraene. All of its ring carbons are sp2 hybridized. How many pi electrons? Eight. So this one would be anti aromatic. Except in its real structure, again, it doesn't choose. If there's a way out of being anti-aromatic, it'll find it. That molecule actually is not planar. It twists somehow and busts up the, the anti-aromaticity. Okay. So that's how we judge hydrocarbons. On Monday, we'll finish this topic up by talking about what happens when there's an N or an O in the ring and what happens if I make it an anion and what does that mean. Okay, so if you, if you want to turn in your homework problems, you can otherwise, or quiz problems, otherwise you'll like to up on Monday.